Okay. All right, we are now live. Okay. Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> How are you? Great, fabulous today. Today has been a beautiful day. Oh. And it is ending out so beautifully talking to you. Oh, thank uh, you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right, Book Mecca fans, all my family out there, I want to welcome you to today's intimate conversation with Timby Locke. If you have not had the opportunity to read her book from scratch, pick it up now. Absolutely. <laughs> this is the book. I have lent this book out a million times probably by now. So definitely pick it up. So we'll have a little brief conversation with Timby. Won't take very long to go through um, just a little bit about the story and your motivation behind it. We're just interested in who you are and how you got to be where you are. So before we get started, I want to tell our viewers a little bit about you. You're an author, an actress. If this face looks familiar, you guys, she has been on NCIS. She has been on, I mean, so many different shows. I was looking through some of your bios and you were on the Wayans Brothers. I oh, was. Man. I played their uh, their long lost sister who showed up and wanted a new relationship with Pops. So yes. those who are big <laughs> Wayans Brothers fans, you will know that episode. I was sitting there looking through all your bio saying, I have seen your face in so many places. Yeah, I'm that, I'm that per that, 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 that actor that people go, wait, should, do I, do, do we go to school together? Do I know you from, and I'm like, no, probably just leave me somewhere on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. So we'll get started with a few questions about your story and about your book. So this is a memoir, a memoir of love, Sicily and finding home. And so I like the way that Reese Witherspoon, she uh, did a little, um, a little write up about it. And I like the way she described it. She said it was a beautiful memoir and it was your take on your personal journey of love, parenthood, and ultimately the loss of your husband, Sato. You learned to heal in the most beautiful way through the support of three generations of women. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's Italian food, lots and lots of Italian food, which when I read this book, you can smell the food coming off of the pages. Okay, that is a high honor and a great compliment. So thank you, um, because I really did want to take the reader, you know, in every sense, like what they saw, what they smelled, what they're hearing, to engage all the senses as you read the book. Uh, the books I love do that, and so I hoped, as a you know, writing my own story, that I would be able to do that. So I love that you say you could, you know, smell the dishes. Yes, I love it. And for all of you who don't know out there, when you pick up the book in the back of the book, there are recipes, recipes. So you can try, in, in my case, definitely try <laughs> to make <laughs> the meals that she made and, in Sicily. Yeah, and some are really easy. They're for, for even for the no cooks. There's one that you just put a bunch of stuff in a blender and press, push start. So you can do that. So what's your go-to? Um, actually, that one I actually had for lunch today because I had like only a few things in the house and I was like, I need something quick. Um, and I didn't really feel like cooking. So that's the Sicilian pesto. Oh, now that one looked pretty simple. That looked like something I can do. I, look, I looked at how many ingredients it was. I said, okay, I can do that. And it's just like, press that blender and you're good. Yes, exactly, exactly. Well, outside of the food, you kind of incorporate food throughout your story. Mm -hmm. And because it's such a deep and personal story, it's it's like a diary. Did it start out as a diary or yeah. was it just kind of written? How did you do it? Well, you know, I, 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 I've always been writing. I mean, and, and what I mean by that is not writing to show anybody or to do anything with. I never thought I would be a writer that was never like in my career path as you you know talked about before I've been in, an actor in Hollywood so I always sort of thought that was my uh, as they say my lane right mm -hmm. that's what I do um but I wrote privately mostly in my journals since I was even a, a little kid but when um my husband my late husband was diagnosed I started writing specifically with the thought of like huh, 
I think I need to make sense of what's going on and like just kind of have a place to put my feelings because I was a caregiver. Anybody in your community who's been a caregiver knows what that's like. You know, so much of your life is about giving to someone else that you have so little for yourself. So for me, the little I could do for me was to just sit with myself with a pen in a quiet spot and just write out all my feelings. Mm -hmm. I did not know or think that would become a book, part of a book, or even inspire a book. Yeah. But I did that for many years. And then after he passed away, I looked at all these writings and they kind of told the story. Hmm. And um, I continued to write after he passed, mostly because I wanted to kind of journal about what I was feeling. Sometimes I would write letters to him. So I was sort of doing all of this intuitively and instinctively. And then at a certain point, and my sister's a writer, you and I were just talking about this before we got on live. My sister Attica Locke is a beautiful novelist. She has five books. And she was the one who said, you have a book in you. You need to write this book. And I was like, wait, what? And she was like, you need to write this book. And so she really pushed me toward that. So that's kind of the evolution. It, was, it wasn't that I you know, was writing, thinking I'm you know, writing a book, but that journaling, which I firmly believe in as a way, especially even now, everybody's in COVID, like we're, this time in our lives is so insane. Yes. <laughs> that, you know, yes. To like take five minutes with yourself and just like write some stuff down, like, you know, is, can be helpful. I, I love it. I love it. It's such a healing process when it comes to writing and getting those things out there. But what kind of struck me was you're kind of raw in what you've written. It's really vulnerable. What did your family, especially your daughter, think about that? So I will say that when I went to, once I knew I was going to write a book, I thought to myself, this is a memoir. And the, the only reason to really write a memoir is the very reason I read memoir. I read memoir to find out, oh, that person went through this, 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 and this, and they came out the other end. Oh, and the memoirs I love are the ones where the writers don't hold back. Mm -hmm. That's why we're pulled into their story. It's the truth and the honesty of it. So that when I thought to myself, if I write this book, I can't really hold back. Because I'm not really within what, who am I serving? I'm not serving the re, I'm not serving me. I'm, I have to just tell it like it is. So the first pass was super raw. <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, that can't go in there. <laughs> like, I gotta take that out, you know, because you do get to pick and edit along the way. But mm-hmm. I wanted to keep the truth and the honesty of things. And I wanted to really um, leave a kind of imprint of what that felt like along the way. And so I knew I couldn't cheat certain moments. I just couldn't. And so it was a lot of bravery and I was scared. And I talked to my family and I was like, I'm doing this and I'm putting this in and I don't know. And everybody was very supportive. And to your point about my daughter, you know, I, she knew I was writing the book. She knew it was about her dad. She knew she was in it. But I also knew as a writer, I'm a mom and I'm a mom before I'm a writer. Yes. So, you know, the things that I, the way I handle what's her story and her narrative and her, you know, I'm very careful about how I do that. You know, when mm-hmm. she's a grown woman, if she wants to, or maybe even before she wants to write her own story, that'll be her story. Yeah. So, but ultimately when it came to me and my feelings, the parts of me that was scared, uh, uh, angry, you know, that missed all of it. I just thought I've got to, I've got to put it in there because that's the only way to read. That's the only purpose. That's why we read. Yeah. That's why you have book mecca. Yeah. You have book mecca because people want to read a story and they yeah. want to see themselves. They want to see like, because I feel like, look, if I thought it and if this happened to me, there is nothing so special about me that about 10 million other people haven't had the same damn thought. There you go. Because I'm not that special in the world. You know what I mean? Like we all have these shared human experiences and until you, until someone else says it, you don't, you, it's not validated for you. So I thought those points, I have to say them out loud because they were true to me and I can't be the only one. Like I'm not the only one. And sure enough, I get so many letters and emails, messages on social media from readers who say, you said the things that have happened to me or you, you touched on something that reminded me of something I'd forgotten or, I, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Bravery. It's beautiful. Well, the way that you describe your family members, yourself, 
it, it's so vivid. You feel as if you know you. I feel as if I know you and your whole family. I'm calling Sato. I'm calling Zoella. I'm just calling everyone. Oh, in my right. Family <laughs> in my head. That's what I'm doing. Well, I wanted you to love my. I wanted you. So here's the thing. You know, this book is a love letter to love. Right. And I mean that in the romantic way, the love that we, he and I shared, the love of family, the love of food, the love of place, the love of travel, all of it. Right. And so I knew that I wanted the readers to kind of one, fall in love with him the way I fell in love with him. Mm. I wanted the readers to fall in love with Sicily, the part of Sicily that I fell in love with, even though I didn't expect I would ever fall in love with it, right? Yeah. Um, the way a mother loves a child. You know, I wanted to sort of really put my heart, my truth on the page in that way. So it's an honor to me that you say, you feel like you know everybody. I, I know, I, I definitely feel as if you are family in my head, <laughs> you are my family for sure. Well, we might be, cause you're from Texas. So exactly. we could very well be. Did you guys hear that? Born and bred Texan, right, right here. here. Straight out right. of East Texas, both my there parents. There we go, 903, <laughs> represent. I need a shirt that says straight out of East Texas. There we go. <laughs> well, kind of going back to, to love, when I describe your book to people who are like, what is this book about? I go, it is a, a tragic love story about love and loss and food and family. And then I get lost with words because I just want them to read it. I just go, just read the book. You'll see what I mean. Because the way that you and Saro met mm. was just so mm. beautiful. I mean, mm. it was straight out of a movie. And it made me feel as if, where are these people? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, where is this? Does he have a brother? I need to know. <laughs> because it was so good. I just was so in love. Well, here's the thing about that is... You know, one of the beautiful things of writing the book was that I got to relive all of that again in the writing of it. So I went back to my point about those journals, like when I was a 20 year old. So for readers who haven't read the book yet, I won't give too much away, although you can pretty much read the back of the book and get a lot out of it. But um, we met, you know, I, I can tell this story because I've talked about it publicly a lot, which is that I'm in 20 years old. I'm an exchange student in Florence, Italy. And I'm walking with a friend and I round a corner and I bump into this man. Mm. And the fact that I bumped into him is the reason why we're on this conversation right now, the reason why the book exists, all of it, right? And so I kept asking myself as the writer, you know, because I was writing this, you know, in my 40s, and I'm like, what? Who was that 20 year old person? Like, did she even know how lucky she was? Life changing. Life changing. Like, had no. I just thought, like, oh, I'm here in Italy. I'm a, you know, I'm, I, you know, I've never been to, never been out of the country before. My passport was so brand spanking new, and I'm in <laughs> Italy for the first time. You know, walking around, with right. eyes, like, like, you know, you know, black young black woman. You know, and I was just, and and that 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 would change my life. Like I was, you know, in a place and time and place that I never imagined I would be. And yet here I was meeting someone who to his credit, mm -hmm. when he saw me and the way he always told the story was he was like, she was it. Like he just knew. And cause I was too, a little bit, I'm gonna be honest. I was too young and dumb <laughs> to know that it was a magical moment, but I quickly figured it out. Wow. That love story that you started out so beautiful and brought your daughter into it. Let's talk a little bit about the next phase, becoming a caregiver, mm -hmm. finding out that your husband had cancer. Mm -hmm. How old were you when all of this first started? So he was, di I was 31 when he was diagnosed. So pretty much all of my 30s, I was a caregiver. And, you know, and that's a part of why I needed to write about it. Cause guess what? Most 30 year olds, all my girlfriends, they weren't doing that. They weren't caring for a sick husband. Some of them hadn't even married yet. 
Yeah. So I was already married and now my husband has a life threatening, you know, illness that often required critical care, depending on what kind of treatment he was doing. So my world didn't really look like a lot of people's worlds. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, me being able to go and write about it was me trying to make sense of it and also trying to sort of find my way through because I still wanted to be, you know, go out with my girlfriends, be, you know, be 30, whatever, have my new, get my new shoes, do all this other, but you know, life didn't, wasn't asking that of me at the time. I mean, I did some of that here and there, but for a lot of it was about being very focused on keeping him well and alive. And our love grew deeper in that time. And I, cause I always thought we had like the most amazing love and the deepest love, but I'm telling you that experience, the trial by fire of illness and, and caregiving really like deepened deepened mm -hmm. our connection. And so that was the beauty, that was the gift of those years. That was a gift for sure. Where did that inner strength come from? As 30 year old, Ooh. becoming a caregiver, you have a kid, you have someone that is ill. Where did that come from? I, you know, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm even asking, it's so funny you asked that question because I'm even thinking of it now because in this time, you know, we were talking about COVID, like the strengths that we're having to draw on. And I keep reminding myself, like you've been through this before. Keep saying, and I can only say, I observed my grandmother who lived in, and you may know this area, Lufkin, Texas. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. <so. laughs> Uh, I spent summers with my grandmother in Lufkin, Texas, right? Like my whole, when my parents were divorced, they would just go, you go stay with grandma during the summer. We got to like figure out life, right? And so my sister and I spent time every summer there. And my grandmother was that generation of women. And she was also the kind of woman who really, I think, imprinted me with one, how you care for the people you love, how you show up for them. She was caring for her husband, my grandfather, who was ill. He had Parkinson's. So all those summers that I was out playing, making mud pies, running around on my bike, doing whatever, in the background of all of that was my grandmother caring for my grandfather. And then we would sit and go, I would go try to go play cards with my grandfather for a little bit. You know, and I think having those early memories was setting me up in a weird way, the universe, life, God, whatever you want to call it was sort of saying to me, watch this, pay attention to this. And sure enough, when I became a 30 year old woman, it was my turn. And I didn't see it that way initially, but I can see it now that like to some degree I've had that. And I think many people have that. If you, many people, that, that's not an uncommon experience, you know, especially if you have multi-generational or if you're close with your grandparents. Right, right. You've seen something like that. That's a, a true testament to your children are always paying attention. They're paying attention. That is definitely true. Because yeah. if you hadn't have had that experience. I probably would have been like, what is this? What's going on? Because I would watch my grandmother. I mean, you literally like, you know, care for my grandfather all day, make food for my sister and I. We were running around creating all kind of holy mess, doing all kind of clean up after us, then go make plates and take them to people in the community. She would go take plates to people, the sick and, you know, the sick and shut in, in her community. So, you know, in a way I was just like, oh, grandma, can we have some more of this? But, you know, when I, as an adult woman, I could go, she was modeling for me how you show up and caregiving. And many people are going through this now, you know, whether it's somebody they know in their life who's intimate, God help if, if they are going through a COVID diagnosis, you know, you just, you, you're there. And you should mm -hmm. know it. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, I think that's where I got that Texas grandmother, you know, yeah. I think that's where I got it. I think that's where I got it. Oh, speaking of Texas, you have the Southern flair and you're in Florence, Italy. <laughs> that was funny. And was one funny. of the most memorable oh, no. parts of the book oh, no. is your dad coming to Italy with the cowboy hat, the boots on, I can just see him. And this is a black man in Florence, Italy with the cowboy boots. Let me tell you, when I, it's funny because when I went to write that scene, I was like, am I just remembering this this way? <laughs> but let me, and I actually, for a moment, I had to put my, I had to close the computer. I was like, let me go find, I need to find some pictures from that trip. Sure enough, there he was full on everything because wow. he was coming to Italy 
because he had heard his daughter say she met somebody. He was like, oh, you did? You met yeah. somebody? Let me get on the plane and come see what that's about. Yes, and, you. <laughs> you know, and that's what he did. And he showed up in that full, in his full self, all of it, and was came with the intent to intimidate. And he was like, I want to look this person in the eye and see who this is. And if I need to drink ass and drink names, I will, <laughs> you know. And sure enough, you know, I, I won't give it away for readers what happens, but but yeah, my dad is 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 that man. Oh uh, that is you guys should read the book. I, I just keep wanting to tell the story, but you should read the book. Pick it up for sure. Now, some parts of the, the story was a little hard for me. I had to look up words okay. and figure out what that meant. Mm -hmm. So you were, are you still fluent in Italian? Yes, although I don't have anyone to practice with as much. So I talked to my sister-in-law um, and I have a couple of Italian friends here, but yes. So it, it's, I love it. I, in fact, it's so funny. I was thinking um, my daughter and I, we try to make it a point to watch Italian movies, you know, as often as possible to keep her, to keep it fresh. Because, you know, with language, you have to use it. Mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we'll know on my next trip to Italy. <laughs> Speaking of your trip to Italy, how often do you go? Well, we go every the... year, exactly, every year. And so we'll see, I'm hoping to go next summer. Mm, that'd be nice. When you yeah. go, are there any areas that you particularly try to do or get involved in, anything? You know, I mean, it really, I, when I get there, I like to decompress. So mm -hmm. I don't try to sort of kick it into high gear, like I'm going to do this. I am not that kind of traveler. I have people in my family who are. They know not to take me on their trips. <laughs> Or if they yeah. are on the trip, I'll say, I'll see you at dinner. Because, you know, there are people who like to hit the ground running, go see 10 things. Yeah. A whole itinerary. Whole itinerary. And I love that. And I respect that. I just can't do that. So I'd like to take it easy. But what I, we always do every year when we go is we spend a great deal of time in the countryside and by the sea. Because to me, that's the beauty of leaving my life here in Los Angeles, which is very complicated, very busy, full of traffic, deadlines, all of it. And when I get to Italy, I want to bring it down, kick it into a slower gear, and yeah. just enjoy, as the Italians say, la dolce vita. Hmm, I like The it. sweet life. The sweet life. The sweet life. I the love it. Life. Yeah. Well, speaking of the sweet life, I, we were just talking about this earlier. Book Mecca to me is my sweet life. It's my sweet spot yes. of the day. Yes. Uh, and the whole reason that I started Book Mecca was to highlight authors like you, your stories, your works, and to amplify not just your stories, but all your motivations behind it. Um, it's a, a true testament, I think, to a glimpse into the lives of people that you may not necessarily know. You may not have an opportunity to know about all the different cultures and experiences, but it brings us all together. And so when you were writing your book, it made me feel as if I could travel. It made me feel as if I had a, an open space, a, an opportunity to find love that wasn't just make-believe. And you have found love again. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. For thank sure. you. Thank you. Thank you. So how did that come to be? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, that, you know, here's the thing I will say about repartnering after loss, which was something that I did not know would happen, was not necessarily a foregone conclusion. But someone said to me, <clears throat> If you know how to love that deeply, somewhere in your heart, you will pull it in again and you will recognize it if you see it. And the thing of that, that Sato, my late husband said, was he told me that he wanted me to have love in my life. Mm. And I write about it, I was very angry with him when he said that. I was like, what are you talking? I was so mad. Like, don't even oh. bring that up. I couldn't have imagined. And then, of course, it took me many, many years, you know, after. Um, but I, 
you know, it, it happened by quite by accident because I was not looking for it. <laughs> and that was how it goes. You know, it's one of those things. And I feel very, very uh, blessed to have, to have known two beautiful loves in my life because I understand, um, you know, for any of us to know love. And by the way, I don't believe that love always has to, we can know great love and it doesn't have to be romantic love. Mm. And I think that's the thing we always have to remember. Because the, I, to, for me, the mark of a great life is to move through this time we have on the planet and love somebody mm. deeply. Yes. To deeply, fully, and you show the hell up for them all the time. Yes. It may yes. be your child. It may be a dear friend. It may be an aunt, an uncle, a parent. It may also be a spouse. But that is a part of what is going to arc us through this life and what makes our life beautiful. So I, um, I try to always, you know, and, and, and so that I would have two romantic loves, beautiful, great. I love it. You know, it's wonderful. But the, but I was willing also after Sato to say, I had that and I can love deeply in many ways and maybe it won't be a romantic love again, but. Wow. That that's beautiful. For all of you out there who don't know, she is a TED Talk speaker. If you can't tell, she has done plenty of motivational um, topics. And you're also an advocate. What is the thing that you advocate for the most when you're doing your speaking? You know, it's kind of what we've talked about here in this conversation. Um, I talk a lot about what it means to show up for love, particularly through the lens of caregiving. And through mm -hmm. the, I really believe, because I because that was such a core part of my experience for 10 years, and I also was a parent during that time, and I feel like most of us, at some point, will have to do that. We will be called upon to care for someone. Now, the whole globe is in a moment right now mm -hmm. where we are being called upon to care for each other. And that may not just be because someone has COVID, but that may be helping a neighbor who is food unstable, who has, a, we have to show up for each other. So a lot of my advocacy work is rooted in my lived experience as a cancer care, as a cancer caregiver, as a newly widowed person who was caring for a child who had grief. So to kind of talk and amplify that message, I don't, especially as a woman and as a black woman to talk about what that looks like. So I really care for that, uh, advocate for that. Also with the medical profession to talk to them about how we um, look out for caregivers, that we all come in different, different shapes and colors and sizes, and we need to sort of be aware of what that looks like. So that's, you know, at the end of the day, I really give people or offer people a call to action for some kind of greater love. That's good. That is definitely good. And you mentioned as a black woman, all of those feelings that you encounter and uh, being pushed into a situation that is not necessarily the norm. You have feelings of isolation and fear and loneliness and all of these things coming at you at once. Did you have someone that you could lean on during that time? Who did you reach out to? Um, I will say right off the top, and I am a big advocate of it. Everybody, if you can get a therapist. <laughs> mm. Get one, <laughs> run, jump, there fly, hop, skip, whatever you need to do. Get yourself a paid professional in conjunction with your best friend, your faith community, with you know family members. But have mm -hmm. a, 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 an independent, trained professional who can walk you through the paces, often of the most critical moments in your life, or if you need to unpack some stuff that's holding you back. Yeah. So I will say right off the bat, therapy, um, that got me through 10 years of being a caregiver through the first years of my, of, 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 of being, you know, a newly widowed person. But I also had my family. Mm -hmm. I had good friends. And by the way, it wasn't one friend. I always, I, 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 I remind people that, you know, there's no one person who can be everything to us. Mm -hmm. So I had my friends that I would need just to make me laugh. I didn't want to talk about the deep stuff. Just. Yeah. I'll call you just to have a good time and lift my spirits. I have my other friends that I could be on the phone for an hour saying everything that was deep and challenging and difficult. And I learned to spread it around, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. we all have busy lives and it's hard to be everything to one person. And I know because I had so many things going on in my life that I needed a community. And that's one of the things I advocate for, be 
be a part mm -hmm. of someone's community, be part of someone's village, right? And people were in my village and they didn't even know they were my village, but I'm like, <laughs> I've adopted you. I think so, join it in. <laughs> Speaking of someone in your village that kind of threw me for a loop in the book, Ooh, your mother-in-law, she joined your village. Let me tell you, <laughs> joined it, became an elder, was a deaconess. Yeah. She was everything. <laughs> no, my mother-in-law, I mean, that was, and that's a part of the art, that's a part of the story of the book is where we started and where we ended. Wow. And the arc of that is, I felt was, that's actually what compelled me to write the book, was I was sitting in Sicily, I think the third summer after Sato passed with my daughter and like the sun was setting and we, you know, mm -hmm. I could smell dinner and the, you know, being, you know, prepared in the kitchen. And, and I looked and I saw my mother-in-law was sitting on the street, you know, the streets are open in, you know, in Sicily, small mm -hmm. town. My daughter was running around and I was sitting there and I thought, how the hell did we all get here? <laughs> like, I literally was like, how did we all, like, how did we get here? Because the person who united and connected us, my late husband, Sato, you know, he wasn't with us anymore. And yet we had found a way to carry family forward, even in his absence. Wow. And That's I felt like that was a story I would want to read. It felt like a story worth telling in the mm -hmm. world that across language, generation, race, culture, yes. uh, geography, that you can make family. Yeah. And she taught me her version of making family, meaning my mother-in-law, the way she pulled me and was like, I'm not gonna let you go. Mm. And, and the way we were each trying to do that with each other, I felt was a beautiful story worth telling. Another kind of love story. Your mother-in-law sounds a little bit like your grandmother, just some of the things that she kind of infused in you and you didn't even know or ask for. It just was just was put yeah. in you. Yes, yes. That even when sometimes, truth. yeah, we didn't even have shared language, you know, together because she spoke Sicilian and she spoke some Italian, mm -hmm. but I don't speak any Sicilian at all. And I speak, you know, Italian. So we kind of, you know, that beautiful way we had to form our own, we did our own dance and our own beautiful yeah. uh, connection. Now, this is a random question. It's not I like a random question. question. You're in, in Sicily, in Florence. How were you taking care of your hair? Oh, my God. I <laughs> love the question. And you are the only person to have asked me that question. And bless your heart. Bless your soul. I love it. I love it. Let's get down to it. Okay, so here's the thing. Because I'm back in the 90s, right? And my hair, so right now, it's all natural, right? Because, mm -hmm. hello life, COVID, all of it. And I like it this way. I like it. I like, thank you. And I love your hair. It's so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> but back in the day, I did what everybody, I mean, I was straightening my hair, right? I was straightening it, you know, a relaxer. That's what I was doing at 20 years old in college. And I, I was telling my sister this the other day. I went to Florence thinking I was going for a semester, just a semester. It ended up being a year, but thinking I was just going for a semester. I was so excited to go. I hadn't slowed down to think about what I was going to do about my hair. Like, I was just like, I'll get, I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Well, about six weeks in, you know what started to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Not too cute. So I remember getting a care package of Dark and Lovely. Shit, my, I was like, I, you know, got on the phone. I was like, please. Oh, they sent me some Dark and Lovely across the seat. Honey, I was doing a whole relaxer, trying to. And then I was like, that didn't work. So I was like, I'm going to take this kit. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm telling this story. <laughs> I cannot believe I'm telling the story. Okay. Anyway, I'm in it now, so I'm going to finish it there up. There you go. <laughs> I took the dark and lovely to an Italian hair salon because what I wanted them to do was to get the back the right way because I didn't think I could do it. <laughs> so I walked in, I explained how to do it. Okay. And then, and I was like, and then just kind of, because I wanted to make sure to get the back. And then we're going to rinse it. And so we, we walked through the whole thing. She was like, I got this. No problem. Da, da, da. She puts the stuff in and you know, that moment starts to happen where it's time to go rinse it out. The flow of the water was so trickly. It was like that scene. You have, have you seen that, you know, that scene in the Spike Lee's Malcolm X with Malcolm X. Yeah. And then he's got yeah. a, like, one, like, I kind of had a mini, like a mini version of that. Oh and I was like, goodness. you know what? 
my hair is going to have to be, I'm never doing that again. And so I, when it wasn't looking right, I was like, I became the queen of headbands and hats. <laughs> every, like literally I got there in the fall and I want to say every picture of me in Florence after like December, I'm in a headband or a hat. Cause it was just wow. all a mess, but you know, it worked. See, that's, that's the real, that's the real that's here. The real. That's the real, you've heard it here on Book Mecca. No one has ever asked me that question. But bam, there you go. We had overseas, dark and lovely, y'all. Overseas. <laughs> I should, yeah, in fact, right? I, I'm sure that the product makers never thought that that they, they you know, that was going to be happening. But that's what they're they're going to be calling you after this. You know that, right? They were, <laughs> well, like, now I'm like this. So I'm like, this is my dark and lovely. Yeah, it's now is it's the love of the natural. We, we're loving it right now, for sure. Well, speaking of, of natural hair and beauty, your daughter is gorgeous oh, her geez. hair is gorgeous everything she just looks like she's just straight out of a magazine oh. when she was going through all of this life change and she was really young mm -hmm. things were happening so fast for her and you could tell in the book she was having a little issue processing it and it, how is she doing now has she come to grips with how things happened you know, yes. And my daughter, I mean, one of the, the reason why I wanted to talk about, I feel very passionate about childhood grief and bringing that into the discussion whenever I can. And because I don't think we talk enough about and we don't model enough for children. What does it look like to lose someone and hold space for a child in that? And often children get pushed to the side and anybody who's listening or who's read the book and who has lost a parent or a close grandmother or father or a sibling or a cousin early on, if nobody in your family pays attention to that, and if nobody in the family gave you space to kind of have your feelings, that stuff shows up and you carry that stuff with you. And so I wanted to be very honest in the book about the places where at seven years old, she was really trying to process what was happening she lost her father yeah and you know it was on me who was also deeply grieving to help walk her through that even when i didn't know i could walk myself through it mm -hmm. and i wanted to bring that to the story because i think so many parents know this um so many children i mean listen i believe that unexpressed grief in a lot of ways is a kind of public health crisis. And in certain communities, it's more of a public health crisis because mm -hmm. they people don't get the help they need. They're seeing more loss for different reasons, economic, social, lots of different things. And so my daughter is doing well. And I wanted to thank you for asking. You know, she is a teenager now and mm -hmm. grief moves in wave, waves and it comes up at different times in different ways, but yes, she feels seen and honored for who she is and what her experience has been. And I think that's all we can ask because everybody has to go through their own, Absolutely. Their own way. How old is she now? She's 15. I have a 15 year old. Oh, so, yep. Mm -hmm. I feel your pain. <laughs> Ooh, yes, oh, I feel you. I know, I know, we just, you know. Just keep going. Yeah, I, and guess what? I was 15 too one day. So yes, I'm yes. sure I was not. There's just some different 15 year olds nowadays. I think I mean, this is a different generation. I don't know. <laughs> Something not right. <laughs> we'll leave it there, right? Oh, yes, yes. Um, speaking about your, a little bit more about your family. Your father, we talked about your daughter, your husband, your new husband. My mother. You talk a lot about your mom. Oh my gosh, I love it. I, yes, right. I wanted to know more about your mom. Well, that's she what just you're don't gonna, put you're me in the book. book, and that's why you're going to be reading my next book. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, it's really? so funny because you know, in in um, so my mother, who I love, is my dearest, is biggest champion, and one of the great gifts of writing this book was we got to have all these beautiful deep conversations about many aspects of our you know sort of evolution we were just talking about being the mother of a 15 year old right mm -hmm. um but the part that people love in the book 
And then I get asked the most frequently the question about, is, you know, my mother, when she came to Italy, when I was there studying, she brought it for real. Like she brought the for real, like her opinion on my life at that moment and what she thought of what I was doing. And I, there were many times when I thought, do I need to put this in the book? Maybe I just didn't belong in there. Maybe da, 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 da. But something told me, no, nope, I'm going to keep it in there. And it's interesting. I had a reader say to me, I'm so glad you included your mother's point of view in mm -hmm. the book. Because so often when it comes to cross-cultural love or interracial relationships, frequently it's only framed from the position of what did the white folks think of the black person yes and often it will happen the other way around as well <laughs> but that doesn't get talked about as much and so you know writing that scene with my mother in florence and the honesty of that and, you know, her saying, yes, of course, you can include that in the book, you know, and that was a part of it. I think there's no way I could have been, I, I contribute so much of my bravery to my mother. Mm -hmm. And so my mother in the, a lot of ways is the sort of, and I think we do this with mothers. I see it with my own daughter doing with me, you know, our mothers are the invisible hand at play in our life. Yes. <laughs> always there they're always there right <laughs> and so you know i think to really write deeply about a mother-daughter relationship in that way that's its own book which is not what this story was Ooh. but i can see that people are like "Ooh, what's what's you know yeah. tell me more so that's Ooh, next tell me more. Tell that's me more. coming next <laughs> well i definitely say that that scene kind of made me take a drink a little bit <laughs> right Speaking of drinks, I we had sent out an ask to all bookmaker fans oh, really? saying, hey, yeah, if you want to have a drink with us, who come on who and have a drink with us. Is anybody having a drink with us? I can't see the Facebook Live is who's having what are you having? I am having a drink. It looks like water, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm going to give a shout out um, to a black owned um, distillery here in Denton, Texas, Noble Wolf Vodka. Ooh. Yes. He I is. love the name. It's grapefruit, made from grapefruit, no calories, gluten free. Um, That is the biggest shout out. I will order some immediately. It will be in the style. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Noble Wolf Vodka. Noble oh, Wolf, right here. Oh my yeah. gosh. From Texas. From Texas. Love Black it. Owned. Love it. I and, and I'm so. not a vodka drinker. I, I get, I'm always a brown girl. I ask people to figure out, try and guess what I'm drinking. That no one would have ever guessed vodka. Oh my gosh. But it's so smooth. You had me at the grapefruit. You know, I like a citrus element. I like a little citrus element. Yes. I wasn't sure if anyone else was going to bring out anything, but there were so many good suggestions that came. There are some black owned wines and I mean, will you, will you publish a list of them? Ooh, yes. Yes. I Can will you share it with the community. I would love to know. I definitely will because I have a whole list, you know, that, that big old TBR to be read list of books. I have, I have the same thing of black owned. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's a wonderful, and that, that would be a wonderful, it's holiday season coming up. If anybody, I bet they ship. I they bet do. They ship. They do. They definitely do. And the best thing that goes with a good book is wine. <laughs> a little drink, a little libation with your book. A little drink. Yeah, that's how we're all taking our vacations right now. We yeah. have, we're imbibing with a little bit, and we're reading a book. There you go. Well, I know we are running close on time. So I do want to give you back some of your time because I know you are a very busy woman between all of your acting and speaking and writing. And there has been talk of a movie. Yes. Is it in the works? Well, I, in fact, that's exactly what I was doing right before we got on the call. So we, uh, the book from scratch is being um, adapted as a limited series for Netflix. So, mm-hmm. So you will get to watch a limited series and take the journey of it in full. And, and guess what? what? Zoe Saldana 
is playing the really? lead role. Yes, yes. And she and her sisters, um, they have a company, Sinistar. They're the producer. So it's my sister and I are, mm -hmm. at, are doing the adaptation uh, along with Hello Sunshine, Reese's, Reese Witherspoon's company. And we've partnered with Zoe and her sisters. And it's like, we call it like this whole, it's just beautiful. And so we're honored that it's gonna be a Netflix, that we've got this beautiful team together. I you know, beautiful creative partners in Hello Sunshine and in Sinistar. And I get to work with my sister. Zoe works with her sisters. It's just beautiful. So how close to the book will it be? Well, it is, <clears throat> it's gonna be close. And yet it is an adaptation. So yeah. part of the reason why I'm a part of the team and why I really wanted to take my hand, take a stab, if you will, mm -hmm. at adapting it is I feel like I really want to keep the spirit of the story. So there's some things that will change, of course, because we also, it's a different medium. It's a whole, you know, but the essence of it as a core love story that mm -hmm. transports you and that you go on this journey with this couple Yes. Is and 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 we will bring Sicily to the page. We will bring Florence forward. It is. I think you'll be. I think you'll love it. I think oh, you will I love it. I, I think you will love it. I think you'll. Okay. I think you'll. You'll love all the things that are familiar, and I think you'll love all the things that you go. Oh, oh! I didn't know. You know, like because there's things that aren't in the book that we can bring to the screen. So there's all kinds of ways that it. it, it it's. I think it's a beautiful melting. Do we have a release date or tentative? We don't because, I mean, let me try to do the math because, you know, COVID and the pandemic yeah. has changed everything. So our, our original schedule has changed, but we are in the writing process now. We're set to begin filming in the new year. So after that, so probably a year after that. Great, great. Okay, so you guys stay tuned. Netflix, it's coming to Netflix. But before it comes to Netflix, read the book. Read the book. And you can have the audio book if you're not a reader, if you like to listen to books. There are people who, you know, some of my, my favorite sort of communications from, from readers have been like, I started reading it at home, but then I have the audio book in my car when I drive. So I like read a chapter, listen to a chapter, read, listen, read, listen. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to start doing that because it's true that you can, you know, use your drive time, although who's yeah. driving a lot right now in the middle of the pandemic, but some people are, you know, and you can, if you have a road trip or anything like that, so. And that's something that's rare and beautiful is you're doing the audio. I did the audio book. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's me. Yeah. I, I love it. all the inflection, you know, what you want to emphasize. I, I love it. And cool. it kind of puts you into the mind as if you were right there with you in the story. Yeah. I, when we were, I had the best um, audiobook producers around, they were fantastic. <clears throat> and I really wanted to sit down when I sat in that recording booth I said let me just tell the story like I'm telling it to a friend there you go there you go and that so it, thank you thank you it was really you know I was very honored by how the audiobook has been received well this has been a magical moment and I'm so glad I didn't fan out too bad on the screen <laughs> for you it, I'm fanning out for your earrings I need those and that vodka and I'm good we got the vodka, we're reading the book, we're waiting for Netflix to come out. We are loving all of the conversation and we're gonna keep following you and seeing how well, I see so many different things coming your way for sure. Director, movie, oh. all of that. Thank you, thank you, for, thank you, that's beautiful. This is, is really anything, wonderful, Shayla. <laughs> thank you, is there anything you wanna leave our viewers with today? You know, I just think uh, kind of what we talked about earlier in the call, which is like, you know, if you take anything away from my book, even if you never read my book, but you just hear this conversation, I think that the degree to which we show up for each other yeah. through, you know, in the, the easy way to say it is through thick and thin, but showing up even when it's uncomfortable. And I think mm. that's really the story woven throughout my book is the ways we show up even when it wasn't easy and when we, what, we weren't always guaranteed yeah. that it would be a nice outcome, but we still showed up. That's the thing that I think is a message the world could use right now, yes. that we all could use for each other as we go forward and, you know, with this election cycle and beyond and the pandemic and beyond is sort of how can we look to hold each other closer instead of creating more yeah. separation and division. 
That's beautiful. And that, that fits so, I always like to end with little quotes or themes or something like that. And, and it matches so well with the one that I chose. Oh, let me hear it. One of your um, uh, mentors in your mind was Maya Angelou, one of your <laughs> inspirations, and she is mine as well. I, I love her. And one of her quotes is, you may not control all the events that happen to you, mm. but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Yes. 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 And yes. that is so true all throughout your book. You are a, a testament to resiliency and strength. And I know that you are an amazing mom that your young daughter is looking up to and loving every moment of it. So As are you. As are you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, book Mecca fans, if you have any questions, if you want to know how to get in contact with Timby and follow her, social stay media, Timby Lock, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, but also my website. You can yes. Uh, become a subscriber there. I do a monthly newsletter. You get all kind of behind the scenes pictures. Sometimes there's recipes. So I don't, I don't inundate people with too many emails, but you'll get nice little things here and there. Well, that is beautiful. Well, thank you so much. And for all of my book mega fans out there, please continue to follow, like us, share, and invite more people to engage with us and amplify more Black authors like Tim Locke. So thank you so much again and have a beautiful, wonderful night. You do the same. Likewise, be safe and be well. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.